And welcome to another edition of X's in Row, the video mailbag series that takes questions online from Canes fans, and we answer them to the best of my ability. All right, here we go. Great question. Opening question from Tony Valdez, at Tony Dammy 1627 You're a great follow, dude. Uh, but what's attributing most of the plays of 10-plus yards on defense? Is a scheme, missed assignments, bad tackling, players, coaching? Yes, and I'll definitely get to the part two of this question. Um You know, I think it's a little bit of everything. I just want to go ahead and take you back to the Clemson game. So we're going to go ahead and put this on the film. Tony, it's just the awareness here early on. It's just very daunting. You know, Clemson's not even going to move anybody along their offensive line. And you basically have every front seven defender just suck up in and on it. So I, I think that could go in on coaching. That could go to a level of an awareness. And then later on, as this play unfolds, you're just going to see Miami get dominated at, you know, points to the attack as this play unfolds. You're just going to see Clemson just be more dominant. I guess uh, some of these 10-yard-plus plays, and for those at home, it's Miami's giving up 19.5 per game. That's second to last in the country. That's not a good look. And then once again, back to this, you got a five-on-one right here. Brooks has no chance. He's going to go ahead and get leveled. Uh, and then watch this offensive lineman, too. So, just dominant, dominant at the point of attack. It's a myriad of different things that need to go ahead and get figured out. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I like the other part of your question that you asked because you asked best non-Star Wars trilogy of all time. So best non-Star Wars trilogy of all time. I think the Matrix was a trilogy, right? They had three in the Matrix. I really like those Matrix Neo, you know, whoa, trilogy. Yeah, that's got to be it. This next question is actually going to be coming from Kaniacs. Uh, he's a Club OBB member, and he asked this in our private chat. He said, Ro, why do you think they didn't use Mallory more along with Brevin? Wouldn't that have relieved some of the bracketing on Brevin? Well, that's a great question, and online, and I posted this clip, at the bottom of the screen, and you can see this at the Student of the Game series, uh, they actually have a bunch set at the bottom of the screen, and both Brevin Jordan and Will Mallory are standing next to each other, and that's the 12-set personnel. That's that's when you have two tight ends and you're one running back. Unfortunately for the Miami Hurricanes, this was a play that went to the top of the screen, and the wide receiver had a matchup, D. Wiggins, with the Clemson cornerback, and unfortunately it went in for an interception. So, yeah, you have abilities there, but that's that's the advantage that Miami needs to find is that when you have teams taking away your tight ends or trying to bracket your tight ends, there's going to be a one-on-one matchup somewhere else, and that one-on-one matchup is outside. So, Kaniacs, appreciate the question, and I'll see you in the chat soon, bud. So this is another great question from D this week, and it asks, how do we bounce back this week? It's like, what is the meaning of life? Um, all right, D, you're going to have to do it together. This team's going to have to rally around each other and prove that it's not the same Miami team from a year ago, that when things didn't go your way, you didn't just fold up shop and go home. The Clemson Tiger loss was a week ago. They reminded you why they were the champ and why you were a contender. They put you on the mat. They outcoached you. A lot of plays didn't go your way. All the 50-50 balls seemed to go their way. But you know what? If you're going to do this, and if I had a big piece of advice, you're going to have to look to emotional leaders, and you don't have to look any further than this guy right here. I mean, just look at the passion on his face. Just look at that ability. Even though you're down, he is imploring his team to let's go. And I think that's at 12 o'clock noon, coming off this prime time you know, stage where the the whole world saw you do well and then do not so well, this is going to be the most important game for the University of Miami to establish their culture moving forward. You took a punch. Now can you keep going? So this is Frankie G coming in hot with a great question. Can you break down some of the LBs? I'm interested in Brooks and Huff playing more. Well, Frankie, this is the hot topic among the message boards, on podcasts, on the radio shows, and on social media. This is where the calling for the younger linebackers is coming from, and I get it. And I kind of just want to show you a play, and it's kind of like the catalyst why. And I'm not here to try to pick on any young men in the program. That's not what this is about. I just understand why people are calling. Now, go back to this play right here against Clemson. It is 21 to 10. 
Prior to this, Miami has a 50-50 ball that gets intercepted in the end zone. You know, if it goes your way, it's 21-17. But now it's still 21-10. It's not revisionist history. And this was the backbreaker to me. This is what unraveled the game into a blowout. And it's right here when this tight end goes into an arc block and just look at him right there into the linebacker. He obliterates the linebacker into another linebacker. Both linebackers are on the ground. And this allows Travis Etienne to break the corner. And even this frame right here, I just, you know, this was the linebacker who got a player pushed into him. You have a safety, you have a corner in prime position. But let's, let's, the catalyst was earlier up front. Linebackers just didn't get the job done. There's a lot that goes into that play. So I understand you're calling for younger players. And it's this time of year, and I was online, and I took a little bit of criticism for it. But I, I said this is when we go from Patch Timber to Greg Vember, and that's a reference to Gregory Rousseau not being able to get onto the field until his sixth game as a starter. I don't know if you're going to have one of these younger linebackers and step up and do the job necessary that the University of Miami Hurricanes need. But at this point, plays like this need to be less frequent on tape. Yo, Frankie G, you come strong to the rim, you get points. Second question, good question. Here it is. Is 23 struggling vision-wise? You know, I don't think you ask that question if the Clemson Tigers don't come to town. And I want to go ahead and show you tail of the tape two different games, right? Go back to week one for me, Frankie, when this was the opponent. This was UAB. This was a zone read. You're leaving that defensive end unchecked. Look at the angle that he's coming across the formation, right? Now, let this tape unfold and watch Cameron Harris's vision right here. Look at that. Right in that juncture, he's right behind his offensive lineman, innately senses his vision is there. He's going to go ahead and find this cutback lane. If you don't have that sense of vision, this play doesn't happen, right? And that ends up going to the house. So that was great vision. You got to go back to week one to have that. Now, now go to the Clemson Tigers. And this is the difference in how they played you. And I don't care how great your vision is. What are you supposed to do on a play like this? That angle where UAB was taken outside, well, this guy's coming right at the mesh point to be a disruptor. And there was a lot of times, even if De'Ara King goes ahead and gives this ball off, it is a negative play. It is a tackle for a loss. Now, in this case, De'Ara King's going to astutely tuck the ball. There's nothing he can do because he's trying to read it. But this played right into Clemson's hands. To go back to your question, I think his vision is fine. I just think it's hard to tell after Clemson did a lot of unique things at the line of scrimmage. They were basically playing in your backfield and it made it tough for you to see anything. So this next question is coming from Jordan Nelson. He's on a podcast, the Force Up podcast. You can check that out. And he also, he's a producer for Slam Radio, but he comes with a very great question. He says, UAB and UL gave us the first glimpses at defensive weakness that Clemson used to blow the doors off us. Who's the next team on the schedule that can exploit those to the point of us potentially dropping another game? Well, in my opinion, you don't have to look very far because it's this Saturday at 12 o'clock when the University of Miami plays against the Pitt Panthers, reeling off an emotional back-breaking loss to the Clemson Tigers. Pitt's coming in with the defense. Now, I, I know your question's geared at our defense, but let me interject as a backdrop. Pitt's defense only gives up about 50 rushing yards a game. They're very aggressive. You're going to see them challenge. They have a goal to get you behind the line of scrimmage. It's difficult sledding going ahead and getting positive plays against Pitt on a consistent basis this year. Their offensive coordinator, no stranger to us, it's Mark Whipple. But it's, you know, I like Kenny Pickett's ability, and I see him, like, you know, making an NFL roster as a late-round pick. I really do. He's He's got a lot of the traits that you look for. He's got very good arm talent. And the style of offense that they're running, it seems like it's morphed a little bit more this year into a more spread concept. I see a lot of three-by-one looks, some two-by-two. Two, uh, Pickett's throwing the ball short, intermediate, and long. I think they're going to rely a lot on their passing game to beat us. And it's the same thing. If, if you don't really generate pressure on Pickett, he's another type guy that could pick you apart. So Miami needs to bring their A game this week. They really, really do. And defensively, I think Miami, you know, is still reeling a little bit. They got to go ahead and fix some things at linebacker. They're going to need their coverage guys to really step up this week because if Kenny Pickett gets a 
big day, and if he's on fire, oof, yeah, no good. So this last question on X's and Row is going to be coming in on Twitter, at Frankie Cosmo, another Frankie, Cosmo251. He asks, how did our cornerbacks look against Clemson? Did they cover, tackle, get off blocks, and keep their assignments well? Well, it's kind of a difficult question to ascertain in parts. To answer your question simply, yes, I believe so. I didn't watch anything back on film and thought there was anything like gross negligence there. I thought they played relatively well. However, you got to look at the box score to see the whole picture. The Clemson game plan was to go ahead and exploit like the linebacker position. So when you consider Braden Galloway had four receptions for 74 yards and two touchdowns, that's their tight end, and Travis Etienne, their running back, had eight receptions for 9.1 average. Those two guys were leading the team in yards, and that really goes to show you that the game plan really wasn't to go outside, and you saw a lot of those plays go to the screen. So that wasn't the cornerback's responsibility that game per se. Amari Rodgers did have seven catches for 62 yards. So looking back, I think they played well. I, I do think Ivy's improving week to week. Uh, the secondary is doing that, and I've seen a propensity to that from the Hurricane kids in the past, you know couple shady games early go back to North Carolina last year uh, they got chunked up a little bit but they seemed to get better as the year went on and on so uh, against Clemson I thought they did okay oh, yeah.